Germany overran Poland a year and a half ago, overran Northern and Western Europe last spring, and overran the Balkans and Greece a couple months ago. A main feature of those attacks has been the speed with which they happened, and also the panzers used to make them happen. I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II in real time special about the state of the German and Soviet armor on the eve of Operation Barbarossa. That operation, set to begin the 22nd, is the German invasion of the Soviet Union. I will, of course, cover it in the regular episodes. But today, I'd like to look at the tank situation. This week on June 19th, OKW, German Armed Forces High Command, issues a directive to Walter von Brauchitsch, Army Commander-in-Chief, to clarify Adolf Hitler's future intentions for the German panzers. In the East, they should live off their own reserves as much as they can. If they take heavy losses, then panzer divisions should then be combined and consolidated. The extra personnel left over from such consolidation will be used to staff new panzer divisions in Germany. From those, two are for France and one for Norway. It also says that tank losses in North Africa are to be replaced as soon as possible, and does not actually specify any reserves at all for the Eastern Front. Now that is interesting, and you can see that there is a lot of confidence implied here, which we've noted before. And Fuhrer Directive 32 from June 11th, which I talk about in the regular weekly episode, specifically says in the opening lines that once the Red Army has been defeated, no serious threat to Europe by land will then remain. The main efforts of the armaments industry can be diverted to the Navy and Air Force. Alfred Jodl, chief of OKW, goes so far as to say the next intended army operation can be easily carried through with the present strength and munitions allotment. One can do just the same with 12 panzer divisions as with 24 panzer brigades. In that case, one saves an enormous amount of auxiliary weapons and rearward services. So basically, German high command thinks it can beat the Soviet Union with just the initial forces, specifically panzer forces they're going to send in on the 22nd. But just what are those panzer forces made up of? Well, I'm glad you asked. The smallest tank the Germans will use in Barbarossa is the Panzer I, the Panzerkampfwagen I. These began production in 1934 and first saw action in the Spanish Civil War. They're pretty limited in armor and armament, having an armor thickness of 13 millimeters and two 7.92 millimeter machine guns on a fully rotating turret. By June 1941, they are very plainly obsolete. And while most are now used for training, which is what they were all actually originally intended for, 281 of them are part of the invasion force. The Panzer II, Mark II, was originally built to be a stopgap tank until more advanced tanks could be produced, but it turned out to be the model most in use at the beginning of the war. There were several variants developed, and by the D and E series, the frontal armor is up to 30 millimeters thick. And with a more powerful engine and new suspension system, they can hit 55 kilometers per hour. That is only on surfaced roads though, and not anywhere close to that cross country. And the Soviet Union is notoriously short on surfaced roads. The big gun is a 2 centimeter L55, and they also have a 7.92 millimeter machine gun mounted next to that. Now, I read in David Stahel that 1939 Panzer training regulations class the Mark II as an anti-tank weapon, but it has actually performed poorly as such. By this year, there is an F series of these in production with 35 millimeters of front armor, but the Mark II is also outdated but there are 743 of them listed to go with Barbarossa. So over a thousand of the tanks to be used are obsolete Mark I's and II's. That's 28% of the German Panzer fleet. 157 Panzerkampfwagen 35's are there as well. These are taken from Czechoslovakia, taken when Germany occupied Czechia in 1939. The heavier version of the Model 35 has 35 millimeter armor, a 3.7 centimeter Škoda cannon and two 7.92 millimeter machine guns, one turret mounted and one on the hull by the driver. The armor on these is riveted and not welded like the German made tanks though. And the rivets have a tendency to pop out on impact, which can be a danger to those inside the vehicle. The more common Czech model used though is the Model 38. These are lighter than the 35s and originally had only 25 millimeter frontal armor, but the E and F series issued after last November added another 25 millimeter plate to that 
and an extra 15 millimeters to the sides. Like the 35s, these have two machine guns, and the main cannon is a Skoda 3.7 centimeter gun. The Germans crew these with four men, a driver, gunner, radio man, and loader. And these are actually pretty reliable machines. 651 of these are to take part in Barbarossa. These are still light tanks though. In fact, half of the tanks Germany will use are light tanks. The Mark III Panzer medium tank was first tested in 1936 and 1937. These had production issues though, particularly with suspension. And so series A through D did not see any action in Western Europe, but series E through J had improvements and have been in large scale production. This tank is intended for anti-tank fighting, and there are armor and weapon differences between the different series. Many have 30 mm frontal armor. Series H has an additional 30 mm plate. J has 50 mm solid plate. The guns are different too. Many of the earlier series still have the 3.7 cm main gun, while later ones have a 5 cm L42. Because of the varieties, there is no real standard Mark III here. But the ones with the bigger gun and better armor are a real improvement. 979 various Mark III's are ready for Barbarossa. One real variation on the Mark III is the Stug III, Sturmgeschutz assault gun. It's a Mark III chassis without the turret and with a 7.5 cm L24 gun built into the hull. The weight saved from the lack of turret goes into armor, 50 millimeters at max. There are 250 of these. The Germans also have the Mark IV medium panzer. These were designed originally for close infantry support with two machine guns for local defense and a 7.5 centimeter howitzer as the big gun. These come in series A through F and yes, like the Mark III's, they have differences in armor getting better and better in the later series. The F having 50 millimeters as standard and 30 millimeters on the sides. 444 of these are set to go in Barbarossa. So. Of the 3,505 German tanks set to go into action June 22nd, 1,673 of them are Mark III's, IVs, or Stug III's. There are 21 total Panzer divisions in the whole German army, but two are with Irvin Rommel in North Africa and two are being refitted and reorganized. The 17 available for Barbarossa are not homogenous though. Different divisions have different amounts of tanks. Panzer Group 1 with Army Group South has divisions that average 154 tanks each. Panzer Group 3 with Army Group Center has divisions that average 253 tanks each. Panzer Group 2 also with Army Group Center averages just 191 per division, but has a fifth division. Panzer Group 4 with Army Group North averages 210 per division, but only has three divisions. And they're all a bit of a mixed bag. Group 2 is mostly German-made vehicles. Group 3 has a lot of Czech tanks, and its motorized infantry is a lot of French vehicles. But what will they face in the field? What is the Soviet armor like? Well, of course, they have their older model light tanks, the T-26 and BT-5s and 7s. We did a special, actually, in January 1940 about the T-26, which saw a bunch of action in Finland and in the Winter War. T-26s are the most numerous of the tanks the Red Army will field this month. Even the old 1933 models have 4.5 centimeter guns that can penetrate 52 millimeters of armor at 100 meters, which is most everything the Germans have, including all models, single turret, twin turrets, and other designs that use the chassis, and there are 53 total designs. On June 1st, the Soviets have 10,268 T-26s. However, a lot of these are in fairly advanced states of disrepair. In some of the armored units, tanks with major drivetrain problems number up to 50% of the total, so a lot of these are cannibalized to run the others. The BT tanks, Batushka as many call them, are more mobile. Both the T-26 and the BT tanks are really lightly armored though, not much more than 15 millimeters, so they may prove to be easy targets. The BTs do also have 4.5 centimeter guns though, so they can be effective, and the BT-7 has sloped armor. This is a big deal because it was a development that inspired subsequent models. Armor hit at an angle increases the defensive protection, the thickness of the armor, by geometry. It's harder to penetrate. And the tank built to replace the BT series was the T-34 medium tank. 
This tank has 45 millimeter, 60 degree sloped armor and a 7.6 centimeter F-34 big gun. This gun can penetrate any German tank armor at medium range. The Soviets also have the heavy KV-1 behemoth. The KV-1 was simply beyond anything the Germans had yet imagined. Weighing in at 43.5 tons with 90 millimeter armor and a 7.6 centimeter F-34 main gun plus three 7.62 millimeter machine guns, the KV-1 could penetrate 69 millimeter armor at a range of 500 meters and was effective against the thickest German armor up to a range of almost 2,000 meters. Now, the Germans are unaware, it seems, of the existence of the T-34 and KV-1 tanks. There are 1,861 of them available to the Red Army. None, repeat, none of the German tanks can penetrate the T-34 armor at more than half a kilometer. And only later model Mark III's with the bigger guns can really do it at shorter distances. As for the KV-1, its armor is impervious to all tank-mounted firepower the Germans have in June 1941. I imagine the Germans will find that out soon enough, and I'd kind of like to be a fly on the wall to see their reaction to that. Thing is, the Soviet tanks have some big disadvantages. They don't have radios, so their communications have to be very basic and they're easy to disrupt. And as I said, a big chunk of the total 23,767 Soviet tanks in existence at this point have mechanical difficulties and are in dire need of maintenance and repair. But it's not just the tanks. 29 mech corps have been created in the last year in the Red Army, and many of them are grossly understaffed and with just a fraction of their required material. Disorganized and badly equipped, many of the drivers of the new tanks have a grand total of only one or two hours of tank driving experience. And you can't even be helped out by radio. Here's a sobering stat. According to David Stehel, in the Western Military District facing Germany's Army Group Center, Mechanized Corps average shortages of 75% personnel and 53% equipment. And a report from this week on the 15th says that 73% of all the T-34s and KV-1s are in need of some sort of repair. Well, that is the rundown on what armor the Germans are going to use and what the Soviets are going to try to counter them with. Each side has advantages and disadvantages. The Germans certainly the training, tactics, and experience advantage. The Soviets the number and the high-end model advantage. I cannot predict just what is going to happen, but I can make a general prediction. A lot of these tanks are going to kill a lot of people, and a lot of the people driving these tanks are going to die. If you'd like to see that special on the T-26 tank, you can click right here for that. And make sure to join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.com or patreon.com. We need your support. So subscribe, ring that bell. See you next time.